What is up, everybody? Wednesday night. I, I kind of left you hanging last night. I, you didn't know if we were going to be live Wednesday, if we were going to be live Thursday, what was going to happen. But I tweeted it out earlier today. We got the man uh, of the of the year, I'm going to call you on the show. Oh, I, I'm going to say, this is the Shout Buffalo Football Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Perino. He is my co-host, Ryan Talbot. And on the bottom here, former Buffalo Bills lineman, Jeremiah Searles, who absolutely crushed it. The last time he was on the show, so he's back, you know, it, it, on the show. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good, man. I appreciate I appreciate coming back on such an esteemed podcast um, with two <laughs> just such amazing hosts. Just being back with uh, the two legends, I'm excited to be back. I'm excited football's back. Um, it's good to see everyone rocking and rolling. Tough night for our boys last night, but at the end of the day, still game up and a couple games up in the division, and we got we got we got things going here. So it's good to be back. We got a lot to talk about tonight, Ryan. Um, we're a day later. You've put up a couple uh, pieces. Of course, the Shout Football Podcast is brought to you by Tops Friendly Markets, your neighborhood store with more. Uh, I was actually at Tops tonight. Uh, it's a funny story. I we do a lot of home pizzas, which is crazy because we live in Buffalo and we love the pizzas. You know, the pizza shops. The pizza in, town. in Buffalo is trashed. I'm just gonna throw oh, that out there. Oh boy! <laughs> oh boy! And Here we go. I'm just gonna Here throw that out go. there. You go ahead. You go ahead. Continue with your story, but I'm gonna. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Okay. Okay. We're gonna have to circle back there. Uh, but no, I was buying a couple. Uh, you know, pie crusts. Um, the uh, I forgot what they're called, but they didn't have the thin crust. What during the pandemic, that this particular brand that we buy, they didn't have thin crust forever. So now every time I go and I see thin crust. I buy like five or six of them, and I was at Top, Tops, the only one that has it. So shout out to Tops for for getting it done. But let's circle back here for a second. <laughs> Buffalo pizza is trash. It's trash, dude. What? I I'm sorry. I've been I've been places. I expected so much more out of like pizza when I got to Buffalo. I think the crust is doughy everywhere you go. Those little pepperoni cups that just hold the grease and the bottoms of them are disgusting. I Ooh. I just I never I never found a pizza in Buffalo that I was like, mm, yeah, I'll eat that again. I think your biggest problem is you didn't have the right places. So give me off the top of your head. Can you remember one experience that was particularly bad? Hmm. We ordered pizza. I cannot think of the name of the place. It came in a red. It was a white box with like a big square with red on the top of it. We ordered it from, it was a bar, same place that you could get a, the pizza rolls. They were really good. Gosh, dang it. I can't remember what it's called, but it just, it seemed like every pizza came just tasted the same to me when I was. Up. All right. All right. Hey, listen, I'm not somebody that's going to really, you know, get after somebody for their taste. Like we all have different tastes, but next time we got to get you back to Buffalo for a game yep. when, when everybody can go to games and, and we'll do the pizza tour the right way. See right. How it goes I'm in that. on that. I'll, I'm definitely in on that. Cause I'm, I mean, as long as we stop by Barbell so I can get some wings. We're, we're... <laughs> 100%. All right, Ryan. You put up a couple stories today. Where are we at? 24 hours away from this game. You know, what are you feeling? You know, I think there are some overreactions. I know the final score looked really bad last night, but the big thing is the Bills pretty much handed them at least 21 points in that game based on the opening field position. Uh, th two or three drives within the 20-yard line starting there. One within the 30-yard line. So disaster. I don't care who you play. If you give them that kind of field position, uh, it's going to be a long day for your team. So that was the big takeaway for me in the game. And, and then today, a little speculation, uh, you know, Le'Veon Bell being released. I thought it'd be kind of interesting if maybe the Bills pursued him for that backfield. Let's get your thoughts there, Jeremiah. Uh, Le'Veon Bell, obviously this run game, we're going to talk a little bit about how it struggled here. They got Devin Singletary. They got TJ Yeldon. They have Zach Moss, who they like out of Utah, who hasn't been able to get back from that toe. Do you think they need to add another piece there, or do you think that – it's about being patient here. I think about being patient. I think that the talent in the Buffalo Bills backfield is extremely good. Um, I, I don't think this is a situation where you're like, man, we, we need to go running back by committee or we need to go get out and get a superstar at this position because I just don't think that that's going to be like the end all be all. I think a lot of it has to do with the, the scheme and everyone executing the scheme. I know Brian Dable. I like Brian Dable a lot. I think that he has a really good scheme. Bobby Johnson's up there also helping with the offensive line. I know what they want to do. I'm watching the game. It's the execution part that we're struggling. And it's not like I'm saying one guy. It's it's one guy here, one guy there. The tight end gets creased. The guard doesn't dent the three technique or a missile linebacker run through it. And those are the things that when you don't do those early on in a game, the play callers, like the OC gets scared to run the football more. 
Um, every good running football team is able to run the ball successfully in the first quarter because the get gives the play caller confidence, gives the head coach confidence, get back to the run game. And I think that's what you've seen with the Bills is they haven't been able to get out the gate strong with the run game. So then they throw the ball all over the field, which has worked. But at the end of the day, you have to run the football to win games in this league. Mm. And they definitely have not been running it consistently. And we saw last night, you know, I almost feel like their lack of run game impacted Josh a little bit, but we're going to get into, into Josh's game, uh, how he's been playing this season. But first, I want to ask you about witnessing what happened last week and how this game actually came to fruition. Because, you know, the Bills under McDermott, they, they're always going to be very um, – you know, standoffish about wanting to talk about any excuses, you know, that, that, that doesn't enter the conversation even after last night. Mm -hmm. But I think that over the course of last week, the sense that I got was there was significant frustration, you know, from, you know, within the organization about the way that it was handled. Now they're never going to admit that, but from, as a former player, how tough could that be on again, off again, getting the game moved back two days, completely throwing off your routine? Can you really blame them for the, the flat performance last night after everything they went through? Yeah, I mean, I, again, yeah, McDermott will never publicly come out and say anything like that. But I can think of as a player, you can almost over-prepare, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, when you have that much extra time, two extra days in, I mean, the game didn't get pushed until, what, Thursday, I think is what it was, or – maybe even Friday. I don't remember when it actually said, Hey, this is happening on, on uh, Tuesday. But by that point, you've already gone through your install. You're already starting to gear up for the game. And all of a sudden you kind of have to almost hit the pause button. And then you're like, well, I'll just watch more tape or I'll watch another thing here. And then you can almost overload yourself and overthink things too much. Hey, let's make sure we've watched this tape so many times. Like, Hey, I've seen this 10 times now. Let's game plan for this specific defense or this specific offensive play because we know exactly how they're going to run it. And so then you find yourself through the course of the game waiting for that instead of just reacting to a lot of things in the flow of the game. And, I mean, another thing, too, I think it's hard to keep your energy level up that high and not start looking to next week, looking to, oh, we had a Thursday night game, now we got a Monday night game, and, and a lot of just distractions. And in the NFL, winning is such a small margin that you need to eliminate all distractions. So there was a lot of distractions. I do think the guys just came out and played flat. I think this is also a very young team, and maybe they started drinking the own, their own Kool-Aid a little bit. Um, then maybe they started feeling themselves a little bit. But I also I want to give I want to give a little bit of credit. I think the Titans are better than people were were saying too. I mean, that's a four 0 football team. They've beaten some bad teams, but I overall think the Titans are a better football team than people think. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. Now we saw Josh Allen last night. It was not the Josh Allen that we've seen over the first month of the season. Mm -hmm. Um, but we were talking a little bit before the show. It wasn't rookie year Josh Allen. It wasn't last year's Josh Allen. It was still an improvement. But what went wrong for him last night? What did you see? Uh, was he pressing? What was the number one thing that you saw with Allen's game against the Titans? You know, I think I think last night what we saw with Allen was a little bit of panic mode. Um, I think that we saw a little bit of him. He threw the interceptions. He hasn't thrown a lot of interceptions this year. So this was really the first game where we saw, like, he threw multiple interceptions, right? So the psyche of a quarterback, I mean, kickers and quarterbacks are the most fragile psyche people in the world. It's just a fact. And so you start getting into your own head a little bit. And I think we saw it. Josh has a monster arm, but check down, check down, check down. Didn't want to push the ball down the field. Nervous a little bit. I mean, he might have McDermott in his ear. Take care of the football. And you got Dable in his ear saying, hey, press it down the field. You got Diggs. I'm open, right? There might be 20 different voices coming to him at one time. But at the same time, I think that Josh is a very confident player. And so I think he needs to get out of his own way in that regard with the confidence piece. But I think a lot of it just had to do, again, he might be trying to play a little bit of hero ball based off the fact that they don't have a run game. Um, and so when things start going wrong in the run game, he might be sitting there going, man, I got to do this whole thing myself. And, and you see that a little bit last year. I think you saw more with him. But now with the weapons he has around him, I think he's starting to realize maybe these checkdowns are okay because Beasley can break one, Diggs can break one. I mean, and I think we need to get Dawson Knox and those guys a little bit more involved in the passing game as well. But, I mean, you, you're you literally a run game away from having a top five, top three offense, in my opinion. But Josh has just got to be smarter with the football. You mentioned Dawson Knox there. And I think that, you know, I mentioned before the game, I'm like, to me, this feels like with John Brown being out, a, maybe a Dawson Knox breakout game. And there was a few moments in that game where you thought, hey, maybe something's happening here, but the drops continue 
to be an issue. And, you know, on the one play kind of ran the wrong route and Josh thought he was doing something else. And at this point, you almost got to give, uh, we haven't, we didn't ask Josh about that yesterday after the game, but you almost got to give Josh the uh, benefit of the doubt on that throw because he right. has been going so well. So for Dawson Knox, what does he have to do, especially once John Brown gets back to get himself, you know, going here with all these other guys that are going to need to be fed as well. I mean, he, I, I, there was big expectations for Dawson Knox going in this year. Yeah. I mean, it's so much of a, a receiver quarterback relationship is built so much on trust. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I use Nebraska offense as a, I mean, we had Adrian Martinez who was a Heisman type candidate at our quarterback last year and he looked like crap. And a lot of it was because he didn't trust his receivers to be where they're supposed to be. And so when you start not trusting receivers, you pull the ball down, you air Merrill few, you throw a couple picks and it's maybe because he was supposed to run around at 11 and he ran it at nine or vice versa. And so I think that Dawson and Josh really got to get on the same page because there's so many weapons and there's so many options to go to that when the bullets are flying and practice is one thing, but when the bullets are flying and it's, I mean, it's a need to have it third down or a big situation, Josh is going to put the ball to a guy he fully trusts. And I don't know if he fully trusts Austin Knox yet. I don't know what it's going to take to get him to fully trust it, but it's going to be him coming up with big time plays like he did. I mean, he had those flashes last year. Where have those been? He needs more of those flashes. But again, it starts with a simple run the right route, catch the football and go from there until you can do those two things. Josh isn't going to trust you to go to you in those situations. But I mean, we see it across the league, how important it is to have that big time tight end that can make the over the test middle. I mean, you see it week in and week out against I me. Mean, Noah Fant when he's healthy in Denver. You see Hunter Henry in the Chargers. I mean, every team seems to be going and trying to find that number one big tight end body that can run. And Dawson Knox is that guy for us for the Buffalo Bills. So he's got to get it figured out in order to help Josh and be an outlet for those guys. When it comes to trust, is it something where maybe if it, it's not like a, a three strike rule, but is it maybe if, okay, twice I'm, I'm done because wrong route first time, catches the ball, stiff arm, 15-yard gain. Then he has the ball go right through his hands, and I can't remember him getting targeted again. And you can even you don't even have to just look at Dawson Knox. Look at Andre Roberts. Roberts, mm. that the interception, came out of throw. It was a little behind him. Should have come up with it, though. Next drive, big third down play. Who does Allen find on the sidelines? Andre Roberts. So it seems like he'll go back to the well at least once. But if, if it's maybe happens two times after that, maybe – you're right. Maybe it is a trust issue. Uh, so from your experience, is it maybe once or twice? And then you're saying I have to go elsewhere and look around for someone that I can rely on. I think it, it's it's once or twice for guys that you already have an established trust for. The question then is, is how much established trust is already there between Josh and Dawson, right? Like how much like are, what's the starting point for them? Is it starting with, hey, everything's an equal playing field? And we trust each other the same amount, right? I know it kind of sounds funny, but like, yeah, then we can go back for one or two. But if there's already that little bit of doubt in Josh's mind, it might be a one strike in your out rule with him right now. Strictly off, maybe there's some drops that we don't see that are in practice. Maybe he's run the run route and the wrong route in practice a few times. I mean, unless he's perfect in practice, I don't know how much Josh is going to trust him in the game because, like I said, when the bullets are flying, there's there can be no hesitation in where you're putting the football. And if there's any hesitation at all, he's going to go to Diggs or he's going to go to someone he knows can go up and get that ball. Let's transition to O-line here for a minute because mm. I think that's been, you know, let's go to the bread basket, you know, while we got you here. Um, and just like that, he's like, you know what? I don't want to talk about the offensive line. <laughs> I'm just going to leave right now. Uh, he'll pop back in here in a second. Um, I, I want to talk about the offensive line, Ryan, because I think that that's kind of an underrated part of why the bills have been so successful especially early on yeah yeah no, okay. you don't don't know what happened. Line, no problem just kick me out sorry don't know what's going on out of back okay no so you look at the success that they had in the first four games and even you know I, I still think pass blocking without a chance to go watch the all 22 yet it's not out i thought that you know from a pass blocking perspective they're still giving josh time to 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 think back there time to go through his reads time to make some decisions are you surprised with how good that offensive line has been, especially since they didn't really have any time to, to get ready outside of the training camp practices? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I played with Daryl Williams in Carolina, so I know how good Daryl can be when he's healthy. And so that was a huge pickup for 
um, I mean, Billy or Billy Brandon Bean and the, that staff this offseason, because I know he's an all pro player when he's healthy and he's playing really good high level football right now. I think Cody Ford inside has been a nice surprise. I still think he struggles at times, but overall, yeah, they played pretty well. I'm very curious what's going on with Quentin Spain. I, I don't know why he's not playing or if he's gotten benched because he was playing awful or I don't really know what's going on. I know he struggled at the beginning of the year. He wasn't playing great ball, but that's mm -hmm. interesting to see him on the sideline. And then the random, my toe hurts yesterday thing is always kind of interesting to hear as well. But I think overall they're a really solid unit. Um, I think that there's, there's no glaring defect when you look at that offensive line, like, Oh man, this is the problem guy. Um, you got winners. Who's a seasoned vet. You got Mitch, one of the better centers in the league. And then Dion, who's just, I mean, he's one of the most athletic guys I've ever seen. So I think that they've been doing an excellent job. One thing I do think is I think that they got Josh Allen a few times on the blitz reads last night. One nice thing about no fans is I can hear all the talking. I can hear what's going on. And so I can hear Josh redirecting things because I still remember some of the lingo from when I was there. And so I'll hear him say, hey, Rita, Linda, move into things. And I was like, no, Josh, don't do that because I'm watching it going, he's baiting you. And then there's a free runner coming at him. That happened a couple of times last night. Um, so I think that's one thing that Vrabel did a really nice job with and that teams are going to continue to do to try and get Josh Allen um, with how well he's been throwing the football or trying to get pressure in his face. You know, you, you mentioned Cody Ford, and I thought that last night was his best game of the season so far. Uh, at right guard, I thought he struggled a little bit. I, I thought that maybe they gave up on him a little bit too soon at right tackle, but Darrell Williams has played really well. What would be the difference from playing at right guard to left guard that would spur on such an, an improvement right out of the gate here for him? Is it the fact that he has two seasoned guys around him in Deion Dawkins and Mitch Morris? Is it that simple or is there more to it? You know, there's a lot to it. A lot of it is comfortability. How comfortable are you in whatever side you're on, left, right? I mean, it really is you have a side that you feel more comfortable on or you feel like you move better out of. And maybe that's because you have a shoulder that's bugging you and it's you don't like having your inside hand being a, a thing that's bothering you, maybe an ankle or whatever. So I think Cody Ford just looks more comfortable at left guard. His set looks smoother. He doesn't look like it's a, a like a jerky set. He just looks smoother and plays better on the left side, in my opinion. Right side, you can tell it was kind of like, a, hey, we need you to play right guard. And he just kind of just went and did it. And he wasn't bad at it, but I just think he's very much more comfortable and probably because he's gotten more reps on the left side over the time that's gone on now. So I think that because guard and tackle, very different sets and the way you move and the timing and everything. So, I mean, just going from right tackle to right guard doesn't mean you're going to be more comfortable just because you're on the right side. Um, you might feel like you're more comfortable. I know for me, I was like, I felt more comfortable at right tackle, but more comfortable at left guard. Like it just, It's just one of those things, like the guard, I felt better on the left side. So yeah, I think that that's a comfortability thing, but it also, I do think that being surrounded by solid players is really going to help his development. I just got done doing a Vikings podcast talking about how Garrett Bradbury, their first round center is development is actually going down this year because he's playing next to two very bad guards. Mm. And so I think that having good players and Mitch Morris, Deion Dawkins or Mitch Morris or Daryl Williams, like either one is only going to accelerate his growth versus hamper his growth because he's around really good players. Are they, how they're currently constructed with the five that are there. And obviously we know our, our guy, John Feliciano is going to be back in the mix any yep. week. Now, do you anticipate him having a big impact in the run game? Cause they were really good run blocking unit last year. That just hasn't been the case early on this season. Yeah. I mean, John's a mauler. I mean, John's an absolute mauler. That's what he's built to do. So I think getting him back is going to be big. The question is who goes to the bench? Do you put, I mean, who, I think both Cody Ford and Brian winners are playing pretty good football right now. So it's, which one goes to the bench or is it going to be a John has to earn his way back in? Mm. Um, is it going to be, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's going to be, Hey, John's healthy. He's starting. I mean, the dude hasn't played a whole lot. He's got a lot of time to ramp and build himself back up and get himself in not just playing shape, but game shape. Right. So I think that, I mean, you saw it last year. They're not afraid to rotate guys. I mean, they're not afraid. They did the rotation last year with Cody and Ty. And so I wouldn't be surprised if whoever they do decide, like you're going to compete against this guy, you know, Sean competition, 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 so I think that it's say, hey, maybe you're if you're competing with Cody Ford, we're going to rotate every couple series, or maybe Cody gets three, you get one, trying to work yourself back in the mix. But I do think John can help bring a spark to the run game, strictly off the fact that he's built for that. I mean, he's built to be he's built to be a mauler. 
All right. We're seeing it in the comments right now. A lot of people talking about, well, the offense isn't the problem. The defense is the problem, but oh. we are going to talk about this defense. There's a lot to, to get into here, but first a word for our sponsor. Ready for football? Tops is. With ready to serve fan favorites, everyone will cheer for. Delicious family or party packs like pizza, sliders, fried chicken, barbecue, or beef on whack. Starting at only $4 per serving. Perfect for game day and any day. Only at Tops. All right, so let's flip from the offensive line to the defensive line, and let's stop, talk specifically about Ed Oliver. High expectations for Oliver coming into this season. What have you seen from your vantage point out of Oliver this year? I think he's, for whatever reason, I don't know if he's dinged up or if he's got something going, but he does not look like the explosive player I remember playing against. Um, Ed Oliver's game is his quickness and his explosiveness off the line of scrimmage because he's not very big. Um, there was multiple times we bounced out all over out the club when we would catch him because he wasn't used to going to a big, faster guy, bigger, stronger guys. And he he figured that out towards the end of last year as I would watch him. But this year, he doesn't seem to have that like, and he's off the line, right? Like he, he that's his game. And so I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know if like, again, if he's dinged up or if he put on a little bit of weight or, but until he gets that back, he's really going to struggle because he's just not big enough to be a big main gap three three technique gap eater type defensive lineman that's just not him and leslie today spoke a little bit about what's been going on and he agreed he said you know we haven't seen the kind of splash plays from ed oliver that he started to make it towards the end of last season he mentioned the knee injury this this game last week or uh, last night was the first one he played without the brace that he's been dealing with and for a young player to your point that's still trying to learn how to win as a smaller you know three technique in this league Having a, a leg injury is probably not ideal for trying to figure that out. But to your point, there's not excuses at this point because it's year two. You need him to make that impact because you look across that line. I think their most effective interior pass rusher right now by a long shot is Quentin Jefferson. And that's not surprising because of how much he won in Seattle last year. Yep. Yeah, Quentin Jefferson's been huge for that push in the inside because, I mean, Harrison Phillips, love the guy to death, but not what you would call a scary – I mean, werewolf pass rusher, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're really relying on Ed Oliver to be that guy. And so, I mean, I think that having, I mean, without him, I don't know how much pressure you get in the middle without Jefferson, unless you try and start lining some guys up. Um, I think that they're going to need to get creative a little bit with the pass rush. I mean, for so long, they've had those guys, I mean, between Kyle Williams, Jerry Hughes, like that Sean was able to say, hey, we're going to line up four and we're just going to rush and we're going to get pressure and we're going to be just fine versus – now that's not happening. They're not getting pressure. I mean, there's multiple times Tannehill was just standing back there flat footed almost with no one within, I mean, within three yards of them. And that just can't happen, um, especially with your two starting corners out. That's a nightmare scenario. So I think that they got to start getting a little bit more, a little bit more creative in how they rush. Maybe they move. I know maybe they move Jerry Hughes inside or maybe they move, maybe they move Trent Murphy or someone inside that maybe helped create that on that third down piece. But again, first and second down, you're going to have those guys, the base guys in there. They really got to make sure they can get in there and uh, rush the passer. You, you know, a good question from the, the comments here. Dallas O'Brien says in the AFC, do we have the smallest front on the, the defense in, in terms of size and weight? And obviously I know you don't have like a, a chart in front yes. of you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, is that the biggest issue here? They, they look small. Um, I think one of the reasons is I'm so used to looking out there and seeing Star, right? You see Star's giant butt right over the center and like, okay, well, he's not getting moved. Like you're just – you're used to seeing Star. And so with no Star, you're kind of like, man, they just look kind of small out there. And and granted, they're going against some teams with some big offensive lines. I mean, the Titans' offensive line I think is a very, very good offensive line. And not alone they have the biggest back in football who – I mean, RIP Josh Norman – but it's one of those things that it, 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 you got to, if you're going to be small, you have to move the front. That's how you win with small fronts. It's how the Colts have been winning for so many years with a smaller defensive front. It's how a lot of teams without those big front, I mean, just maulers, they slant, they stunt, they twist, they try and beat, they try and beat the offensive line with speed. And that's what I mean when I think that Sean's going to get a little more creative of, hey, full line slants and all that. But the problem is that's a very feast famine type of thing. You're either beating a defensive lineman or beating an offensive lineman off the get and getting a negative play, 
or all of a sudden they they stop the slam or they stop the slut and they're or slant and they're the stunt and there's a huge crease getting hit in there. So it's it's a definitely feast or famine reward type system, but I think it can be very effective with the fronts that we have. Has Matt Milano the obvious you know, what we've seen that's been missing when he's been out of the lineup, has that helped his case in earning that big deal in Buffalo or has his lack of availability maybe cutting into the chance that the Bills or even another suitor across the league will be willing to pony up those kind of dollars that he's going to command? Because let's be honest, when he's on the field, he's a vital piece of what they do. I mean, he's so versatile. He could go, you know, sideline to sideline. He's great in coverage against the run as a blitzer, but he's he really does struggle to stay healthy. Yeah, I mean, that's the number one thing when you talk about contract extensions or you're talking about guys getting paid is the first thing teams look at is what's his availability? What's his durability? How well does he do? Because everyone's like, well, look what happens when he's not on the field. But a team's going to look and go, well, why isn't he on the field? And whether that's the Bills or that's any other team, that's the first thing you look at. Now, Milano's a fantastic player. So like you said, he's an every down defensive line or defensive uh, linebacker. And when you have two of those guys on your team and Edmonds and Milano, it makes, I mean, I was lucky enough in Minnesota. I had it with Kendricks and Diggs or Kendricks and Barr. I mean, it really does make top defenses, top defenses when you're not shuffling guys in and out. Or you have certain guys that, you know they struggle in certain things, so you can tell. So I think the biggest thing is he's got to stay healthy in order for him to be able to get that big deal. But it is nice and a little bit of a validation piece for him to see how much he really means to this team. And Tremaine Edmonds is interesting because he he's kind of been the, the defensive scapegoat early on this year. I mean, people are just in the comments just – furious at the regression that he's that he's had now there's a there's a chunk that believes that maybe he is out of position and he should be either put on the outside uh maybe use more as a pass rusher and then there's some that wonder okay you know he has been injured have we seen the best version of, of Tremaine this season but either way you want to slice it he he hasn't been good enough this this year but Leslie Frazier said today no matter if he's hurt or, or whatever gets him out there we need him out there uh, they they still believe in what he brings in those other parts of the game, his leadership and, and calling the defense. What what do you think? I think he's hurt. Um, I, I've played against Tremaine. I've practiced with him for a year and a half. And I mean, the kid's one of the more physical specimens that you've ever seen. And watching the way that he is approaching his contact, I mean, even getting off blocks or instead of trying to thud an offensive lineman and shed the block, he's kind of backing up and trying to more finesse move it. I think he's hurt. I don't know what's hurt. I don't know if it's a if it's a back, knee, shoulder, but I think there's something wrong because I do think he's one of the most diverse football players on the defensive side of the ball in the, in the league with the things he can do. I mean, the range he can cover so quickly and the athletic ability and the physicality is everything you're looking for in a player. And let's not forget he's, what, 22 years old? I mean, the kid's super young still. So, I mean, he's still got a lot of development to go. Um, but I do think that you need to you need to get him healthy. Um, but the problem is if Milano's out and Edmonds is out, you're you're really struggling. So I mean, if Edmonds can go, I agree. There's a there's a certain piece of we need him on the field, but at the same time, like you got to make sure that he's not going to be available down the stretch, and this isn't going to be something that just lingers all year and again hampers his development. Okay, so from one banged up tray to another, is Tredavious White the most important piece on this Bills defense, especially after what we saw last night? Yeah, I mean, he's a huge piece of it. Don't get me wrong. Anytime you can have an all-pro corner on your team, it's extremely important. But I think that one of the reasons Tredavious was, is so good is because of the pass rush that has been generated in the previous years. Um, I've, I mean, you'll ask any corner, like best, best, best pass defense is a good pass rush, right? I mean, you see it with guys in his face, you're, you're getting a ball out quicker, you know, routes aren't developing, the timing's off. And so I think having that great pass rush, but again, to Dravis Wise, such a phenomenal cover guy that you need him out there too. And so again, as bad as last night looked, we missed a lot of key – and again, it's not an excuse, but we were missing a lot of key pieces on our defense and really, I mean, a couple guys on offense too. And so I think that the sky is not falling, Buffalo, as much as, as, much as we might think it is. I think that last night is going to serve of one of two ways. Uh, it's going to be a gut check and they'll come back swinging, or it's going to be a glaring thing that lasts a week or two hangover. But Tredavious White coming back is going to put a lot of things back in perspective. 
Take me inside an NFL locker room in these moments because, you know, everything's going swimmingly. I mean, really, there, there, as a coaching staff, I'm sure, and, you know, position groups as well, there's some anxiousness about going into a season like this where there was not the opportunity to really prepare yourselves, mm -hmm. you know, with preseason games, OTAs, mini camps, and then you get into it and you're like, man, we got the number two passing offense in the league. Like our defense isn't really showing up early, but it, it hasn't mattered. And then you do get punched in the mouth like the Bills did yesterday. W what are the conversations going on uh, on this on this Wednesday? Yeah, so I'm going to flash back to 2016 um, when I was in Buffalo – or, yeah, I was in uh, Minnesota and we started the season 5-0. and And like you said, everything was going swimmingly, right? We were on top of the world. Nothing had happened. Well, we finished the season 8-8. Eight and eight. So mm -hmm. we, we definitely went through some of this adversity. And I'm telling you, this team is going to teeter on the tanking side of it or the learn from it. Now, we had a ton of injuries in Minnesota that 2016 year. And so we were playing backups across the board, myself included. I started like 12 games that year, and we just shuffled everyone around. Now, that's, again, not an excuse, but I think Buffalo is a more talented team than we were in 2016 with Minnesota. So I think the biggest thing for them right now is to not play the blame game and in in the locker room, it was like, well, you weren't doing this the first four weeks, so why are you doing it now? But the more of the, hey, let's let's fix it and move on, because nothing gives a team more confidence than going out next week against the reigning champs and playing well and winning, right? I mean, you go out and you you fix the things that you really didn't do well last week, right? Say maybe tighten up the coverage, you get some more pressure, Josh plays better, you get that run game going. That's going to be the staple of how this team goes. I've always said you can always judge a head coach, not based off of the wins and losses, but how prepared your football team is. And so Sean McDermott's going to prepare this football team well. And in the locker room, you can be prepared by the best of the best. I mean, you could have the best coach of all time, but at the end of the day, you have to execute as a player. And so how well this team executes next week will really tell me how well the message was received in the locker room. So – you mentioned, you know, this game on Monday and, you know, I think it's almost like you kind of get back to the facility and you start planning for, for Kansas city and take a deep breath and realize, okay, we can get back to at least some sort of normalcy this week. We can get mm -hmm. into a game routine. We got a game Monday. And then you start to break down the matchup itself. And, and it really is two star quarterbacks, obviously Patrick Mahomes in, in kind of a, a different uh, echelon, different tier stratosphere. Oh yeah. A different universe. What does, what does Josh have to do in this game to make big plays, but also not try to do too much? Where's the balance there? Because you have to have it a couple, you know, turnovers in this game and it's over. I mean, Kansas, I mean, this game already is going to be a shootout. I'm saying maybe the first of 40 maybe wins it with the way the defense right. has been playing. Yeah, I think one thing Josh has to do is not get caught into the the scheme or get caught into the trap of Allen versus Mahomes. It's Buffalo Bills versus the Kansas City Chiefs because that's all anyone's going to talk about this week, right, is Allen versus Mahomes, Allen versus Mahomes. And as a quarterback, I mean, you can fall into the trap of you want to go tit for tat and match each other and get into the game within the game. But I think Josh has to really understand, like, he's not Patrick Mahomes. Nobody is Patrick Mahomes. Like, nobody can really do the things that that dude does. It's insane. And so I think that what he's got to do is he's got to be like, okay, I got to ignore all that and focus on what can I do to help my offense, whether that's running the football, play action shots, giving the deep shots. But the big thing is Josh has to capitalize on his opportunities because there's going to be them, right? But the one thing, too, is the defense is going to have to help Josh out a lot by not letting them get behind. I think I think if if the Buffalo Bills fall behind two scores in next week's game, it could get ugly really quickly because I think then Josh will start trying to kind of do what he did last week, hero ball, and start forcing the ball where he doesn't want it to go and just kind of doing that. So I think the big thing is the defense is going to have to be the one that really steps up next week. And, I mean, Best of luck, right? I mean, I guess the Raiders did it, but you got you got a wounded dog coming in next week that's going to be mad at the world. So I think that that's going to be the big thing. But also, Josh just needs to play within himself. Don't try and do too much. Don't don't get outside of yourself, which we saw him do a little bit this last week. So right now, the Bills are four and one, three and one within the conference. Where do the Bills? Uh, where do they stand right now? I guess in the conference itself, based on what we've seen in the first five weeks of the season overall, not just with Buffalo, but with the AFC as a whole. Yeah, you know, I think I still think they're they're a top five team in the AFC. 
Um, I think that where they fall in that top five is very fluctuating. Um, but with the offense that they have going, I know that Sean's going to get this defense on track. Coach McDermott, I refer to him as Sean. I'm retired. I can do whatever I want. Um, but whenever, <laughs> like, Sean's going to have this team ready to go and have the defense, like, figured out here by the end of the year, especially when we start getting the pieces put back together of everyone being healthy on this defense. So my thing is, can this offense continue at the pace at which it started? Uh, it, it's going to be hard to. I mean, they're putting up ridiculous numbers. I mean, Josh Allen's numbers were better than Cam Newton's MVP season at the beginning of this year. So, I mean, that's going to be a hard bar to continue at. But if they can kind of meet in the middle of this offense, maybe kind of levels itself out a little bit and kind of gets consistent with what they're doing and the defense continues to rise, I can see them winning the division. And I can see them being a three or four seed or maybe even a two seed, um, depending on how this game goes on Monday night. I think this is, I mean, if you want to be the one seed in the AFC, you got to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. And there's no way about that. Now they don't, they go lose this game. I can see them being a two, three, four seed um, going into the playoffs here um, based off of what I've seen from not just the division, but really the all of the AFC. Jeremiah Searles, the, the, the man, like I, I, I really do appreciate you always taking your time coming in here, giving us uh, your knowledge. Uh, why don't you let everybody know where they can find you and uh, what you got cooking here in the next. Uh, yeah. Days. So you can uh, appreciate that again. Thank you guys so much for having me on. Um, you can follow me here on Twitter at my channel here. Searle 71 underscore uh, H S K R. You can follow me on uh, Instagram at J Searle 71. What a cutie. Um, you can also, if you're a Husker fan, by any chance in the name of the things, I will be doing a ton of Husker football content as the Big Ten gets started here on October 24th. I'll be doing uh, three different shows for them. I'll be doing the opening drive, five hours before kickoff, 90-minute pregame show on Facebook Live for them, and then uh, the fifth quarter show, the instant reaction show right afterwards. So if you have any desire to listen to that, um, be sure you check in there. Husker football, I know, is an afterthought up there in New York. But uh, we're excited here in the middle of the country for Big Ten to get rocking and a roll again because it's been really boring without that. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised how Bill's Mafia tends to support their people. And uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you get a couple of Husker fans uh, uh, in the long run here. But, my man, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be back for the preview show on either Saturday or Sunday. Stay tuned for that. Uh, until then, guys, have a great week. Uh, I know it's coming off of a, of a bad loss, but that's the great thing about the NFL. You get a new game every week. So, uh, Jeremiah, have a good one, my friend. Absolutely. Go Bills. All right. So, Ryan. Before we get out of here, final thought. I always like to give you the final thought here, man. Like yeah, uh, yeah. it's kind of become our our tradition. So why don't you hit everybody with uh, with, with what you got? Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I agree with what you were just kind of saying there. With the, it's, it's a week by week league. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. Um, you know, after four weeks, everyone was talking about Josh Allen MVP candidate. Josh Allen, this that he's made great strides. He is still having a, a great year. Uh, if you would have told any Bills fan after five weeks, hey, if I told you you could be 4-1 and one at this point in the season and have a, Josh Allen completing high 60% of his passes, Stephon Diggs being near the top, if not at the top of the league in receiving, would you take that? I think every single Bills fan and I know would say, no one's going to sit there and say, well, I want 5-0. and oh. Teams are going to lose. No one's going a, a perfect 16-0 and 0 this year, in my opinion. I'd be shocked if anyone did. Uh, so keep that in mind. The Bills are still in really good shape. They have a tough game this Monday, but then they have the Jets after that. And then they have a real, you know, two games, Seahawks. But that game against the Patriots, that's going to be that measuring stick game for the AFC East. They've already beaten the Dolphins once, the Jets once. They need to prove that they can beat the Patriots. If they can do that, that's going to do such a boost for them within the division, but also the conference as a whole. Campy Poo is upset that we didn't take enough questions. Well, that's what we're sticking around for. If you got a couple questions you want answered, drop them in the comments right now. I didn't want to keep Mr. Searles too long. He was very gracious with his time. But one thing I did want to note, I was listening to in on uh, Leslie Frazier's um, press conference today. Asked him a little bit about Tremaine Edmonds, the coverage issues. Uh, we'll have some coverage on that in the coming days over at Syracuse.com, NewYorkUpstate.com. But um, he was asked by Kim Jones, our guest last week, if he had taken some time to talk to Josh Norman after yesterday's game, you know, her question was basically implying like, you know, he didn't have a great game. You know, there were some moments in there that he'd obviously as, as Sean and Leslie always say, would like to have back. 
And he said he did he did go up and talk to Josh Norman. And he said, uh, I know he's a veteran in this league. I know he's had a lot of success in this league, but you never know how a player is going to handle a situation. He obviously had one of the highlight plays of the day and not in a good way when he got, you know, strong arm by Derrick Henry in a, in, in a very violent fashion. And, you know, Leslie went up to him after the game and just said, hey, man, uh, we're going to need you. Uh, especially if Tredavious White can't play next week for, you know, I, I know Bills fans are cringing when they hear that, but, you know, you want Josh Norman to, you know, be able to remain at the confidence level that he showed in his debut and not let that linger at all. And so I thought that was interesting that Leslie spoke a little bit about, you know, keeping him in, not in check, but keeping him positive, keeping him energized because they are going to need him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt. Uh, the big thing about Josh Norman, too, is I rewatched a few of those plays last night. I thought the one pass interference call against him was a really bad call. It looked like A.J. Brown slipped first and foremost or sold that. And two, that pass was not catchable. Uh, the first touchdown they gave up to A.J. Brown, I thought he actually had pretty decent coverage, just didn't get his head turned around. It's little things that could get uh, fixed for the most part, in my opinion. So it wasn't the greatest debut with Josh Norman as your cornerback number one, but hopefully Trey White is back on Monday. If he's not, Norman gets a chance to kind of redeem himself here in Buffalo in a, you know, again, a, a big national audience type game where the Bills can make a real statement if they can hang and obviously if they can defeat the Chiefs. We were on a, we're going to be back this weekend at some point to talk about this game uh, in, in great detail. I'm excited to get the, Kansas City Chiefs up on the on the big screen this week. Watch a little bit of that game because I didn't I didn't actually watch live. I was watching Red Zone, um, the Kansas City Raiders game, uh, which I think is going to tell us a lot of, about what we're going to watch this weekend and the matchup that Josh Allen and, and this Bills team has. Um, there's one more question in here. Let's get to that because it's not really a question; it's a comment, but it's a good one because it's something that I've kind of been t- talking about, you know, within some circles for the last couple weeks, and and that's Taron Johnson. Um, he's getting exposed in the middle. Rico Ali says uh, he does well with undersized slot wide receivers, but struggles with bigger slot wide receivers. And, you know, unfortunately in this day and age, Ryan, a slot nickel cornerback is going to usually end up facing a team's number one traditional X or Z because there's so many more options that you can kind of utilize out of the slot with your best playmakers. And, we saw it last night when I think it was a one play by AJ Brown where he just basically tossed him aside. Um, and so I think that, you know, for Taron Johnson, one of the things that's interesting, if you get Trey White back, I think Cam Lewis did himself some favors yesterday. I, I think that, you know, Leslie Frazier said what impressed the Bills the most. And it's not just that he was willing to take on Derrick Henry a few times as a tackler and he held up pretty well in coverage. He wasn't tested a whole bunch, but was that he stepped up in a big spot on national TV, filling in as a starter without very much experience. I mean, the only real experience in the NFL that he's had in game action was the preseason for a one and a half games last year. And he went out there and, and I think he did himself some real favors. And I think that he could be in that competition for that, for more work in the nickel spot. Yeah. Taron Johnson has struggled in coverage. He's made some really nice plays against the run, but that's not enough in today's NFL uh, to keep your job, especially like you said, when you're going up against some, some pretty good wide receivers week in, week out. Uh, I believe he was the one that gave up the 20 yards on the third and 19 where he kind of gets. So you're right. And, and it's little moves that you have to keep an eye on across the league. You know, no one really batted an eye today where the, when the bills added Lafayette Pitts to their practice squad, but Pitts can play on the outside. So maybe they're thinking, okay, Trey White comes back. We have Trey, we have Josh Norman as our starters. You have Lafayette Pitts, who can be elevated from the practice squad, can provide some depth on the outside, and then you can move Cam Lewis on the inside, give him that opportunity to become that uh, really important piece to that defense. So, yeah, he made the most of his opportunity. And I did see now that we do have one more question here that you put up on the screen. Yeah, what uh, does Brandon Bean make any moves at the deadline? And in conjunction with that, um, can you see the Bills trading for Zach Ertz or Evan Ingram? That's interesting. And Evan, Evan Ingram is is interesting because he was a teammate of Dawson Knox at Ole Miss. And so wouldn't that be an interesting dynamic in the locker room? And I'm sure that Dawson would welcome into the locker room. And I, I think I believe from conversation last year, they're, they're friends. So I wouldn't expect it to be. But, you know. I really do think that, you know, depending on cost, I don't know how much 
adding, you know, I, I think Evan in Ingram's good, but I think he's had his issues. I think Zach Ertz is, is probably in the twilight of things. So, you know, one person that I think Bill's mafia was super uh, energized about adding like last year, or the year before was Kyle Rudolph. And I, and I just don't know necessarily if you're going to necessarily get the bang for your buck that people are, are kind of hoping for. But I think that does a move make sense if the, if these issues continue into next week and maybe the week after, I think, he, I think all options will be on the table for Brandon Bean, but I'm always hesitant to believe that you know a blockbuster is in play just because of what he'd have to give up and what he already gave up to get his blockbuster of the offseason Stefan Diggs yeah no blockbusters are going to happen in my opinion like you just said uh tight end maybe I mean that that has been an underwhelming position no consistency there Tyler Croft had a nice game obviously with two TDs a few games ago I think if they're going to make a move, it's going to be on the defensive side of the ball. I don't think it would be on the D-line. They already have too many pass rushers, even though maybe they're underperforming. Maybe you get a big guy that can clog up the middle. That's a little bit different than a pass rusher. Uh, I think really maybe they're going to be looking for a cornerback, uh, someone in the secondary, if they, they're not liking the play at that point in time. And it's not going to be a big name, though, if they do. It's going to be someone that they can get for a, a late day three pick, maybe someone – that is familiar with the system that could come in and there's not as much of a learning curve. It could be a linebacker for depth purposes because we've seen what this defense looks like uh, without Matt Milano. And if you you're worried about him long-term because he was listed as week to week uh, coming into this past game, maybe that's the route you go offense. I'd be surprised, but yeah, I think Brandon Bean would, would look and see what's out there on the defensive side of the ball. If it's going to give you an immediate up, upgrade, it's going to help you in the short term where their goal this year is to win the division and to win a playoff game, I absolutely think he's at least going to see what's out there. We'll be interested to see what the Bills practice schedule is this week. We haven't gotten it yet. Uh, I'd imagine tomorrow uh, will be some type of practice, but we we, we don't know yet. Uh, we haven't gotten that information, so stay tuned. Uh, I'm at Matt Perino on Twitter. He is Ryan Talbot Bills on Twitter. Find Shout, a Buffalo Bills football podcast on all the audio platforms. As always, subscribe, rate, and review. It really helps us out. We're so appreciative of you, to, of you guys, uh, all the support that you've given us over the last couple months. Uh, we're going strong uh, into a, a, another big weekend, another big game, and we will have full coverage uh, this weekend. For Ryan Talbot, I am Matt Perino. Have a great week and enjoy your weekend. We will see you soon. Ready for football? With every game a home game, Tops is ready for you with its TV a day giveaway. For six weeks, every day you shop is a new chance to win a massive 70 inch 4K TV. Shop Tops for the best deals in town, in store, or online to win.